Welcome to the Low Carb MD Podcast. No one is beyond help. No one is beyond hope. As we have always said, we are bringing you medical information and cutting edge science, but none of this is medical advice. Please seek out input from your own doctor. Hello and welcome to a special Journal Club edition of the Low Carb MD Podcast. Today I'm joined by Dr. Laura Buchanan. Dr. Laura, how are you? I'm doing great. How are you doing today? I'm doing very good. So today we're going to be talking about food addiction. Food addiction, when you talk to our family members, our patients, our friends, they all know it, right? They all know it. They say, I'm a chocoholic. Have you ever heard anybody say, I'm addicted to sugar. I crave bread. Once you pop, you can't stop. So clinically, and, and just as a human, many people understand what food addiction is, right? I'm a chocoholic. I crave ice cream. When it comes to the scientific and clinical community, it's not exactly something that is agreed upon. And uh, there are a growing body of evidence that supports the idea of food addiction, but most uh, critics and many conventional dietitians and doctors would say, how is it that we can be addicted to something that we need? And so these have brought some interesting discussions and interesting papers into the landscape over the last 10 years. One of the uh, sort of biggest people, biggest researchers in the field um, is Dr. Gearhart. Dr. Gearhart, who used to be from Yale uh, and helped founded the Yale Food Addiction Scale, who's now at uh, University of Michigan, has been studying food addiction for a number of years. Part of the reason why food addiction hasn't, uh, hasn't become more widely recognized because, was because there was no strict criteria to diagnose it. We had a couple of surveys, like a binge eating scale, and a Yale food addiction scale, which were surveys that were very, very cumbersome and would take, you know, maybe 30 to 45 minutes to, for patients to take and for physicians to review. But as the DSM, which is the Bible for sort of mental health issues has evolved, uh, the new substance abuse criteria for DSM has been used by many practitioners around the world to identify food addiction. So what are some of the ways you could screen for food addiction? Just uh, a simple uh, cage questionnaire is what we use in our office. Do you want to cut down? Do you get agitated when somebody tells you to cut down? Do you feel guilty or shameful? You know, do you uh, eat uncontrollably? Do you, do you eat in a way uh, that puts a lot of psychological distress or physical distress on you? Are you eating to the point of self-harm? These are some of the ways you can alert yourself in your clinic if patients are suffering from food addiction. One of the, uh, you know, one of the most uh, uh, leading people in the field is uh, somebody very close to me, Dr. Jen Unwin, and that's whose paper we're going to be criticizing today. So should we start there, Dr. Laura? Let's do it. So tell us about Dr. Jen Unwin and tell us about her paper. I'm going to share my screen here. So if those of you don't know, Dr. Jen Unwin is a psychologist uh, in the UK and uh, her counterpart, Dr. Uh, David Unwin is, uh, is a, uh, sorry, a general practitioner from the UK who has reversed diabetes. And I think if I'm not mistaken, Dr. Laura, we're gonna be discussing his paper on another day. Yes. Okay. Another excellent paper. Yeah, we recently, I had recently had the opportunity to meet both of them in person at Low Carb Boca. And it was just such an honor and pleasure. They are not only incredible practitioners doing wonderful things in their fields, but they are just such genuine, good people. So it's, it's really cool now to get to kind of review their papers and see what they're doing. So uh, tell us about the paper, the title, and where was it published? And uh, let's get started. Yeah, so we're going to be reviewing 
the um, Dr. Umland's paper, low carbohydrate and psychoeducational programs show promise for the treatment of ultra processed food addiction. And this was published in Frontiers. Um, actually, I'll tell you the exact real quickly. Um, it was Frontiers. Frontiers of Psychiatry. In Psychiatry, thank you. Yeah. That's what, okay. So moving on. 20% of adults, depending on which study you look at, meet criteria for food addiction. However, as you mentioned, this is still not recognized in the medical community as a diagnosis. And there's a lack of research in the area of actually treating or reversing or putting in remission food addiction. So this paper investigates the effects of a whole food, low carbohydrate diet on food addiction symptoms. The... It included three different clinics from the UK, Sweden, and the US with about 30 or a little bit more people from each site. The intervention consisted of weekly meetings for the first 10 to 14 weeks that were 90 to 120 minute sessions. And then thereafter, they were 60 minute facilitated monthly support groups for the next two years. And all groups actually established their own independent support groups. This group sizes vary from 11 to 40 participants, and they discuss understanding food addiction, reflection, help people build their own individual food plans, imagining a life beyond food addiction, resiliency, uh, sugar is a drug and triggers relapse prevention. And the main recommendation was abstinence from sugar, grains, processed food, and any food that individuals were unable to moderate. So their outcomes, they looked at changes in the modified Yale Food Addiction Scale 2.0 and then changes in CRAVE. And CRAVE, you can see there on the side, so that's compulsion to eat, reaching for more, activities neglected, volume uncontrolled, exclusion causes withdrawal symptoms, and can't stop doing that despite damage being done. And again, in some studies, 20% of the general population have symptoms of addiction to certain foods. The modified Yale Food Addiction Scale includes 13 items, one for each of the 11 of the 11 criteria in the DSM-5 for a substance use disorder, and two items to assess the clinically significant or impairment or distress. So an example from that would be, I ate until I was physically ill, and there are eight choices from never to every, every day. So the population was an average of 50 years old, predominantly female, 90 to 100 percent, and the Yale Food Addiction Scale pre-intervention was five, which would qualify as a moderate food addiction, and the craved pre-intervention scale was a five out of six. So the reduction, and we're showing a graph here for those of you who are just listening, the reduction in the Yale Food Addiction Scale was by 1.52. So can we give people some context on sort of the baseline uh, of these people, because let's help them interpret those scores, because somebody uh, with these scores, you know, these are people who are likely experiencing significant psychological distress from eating, right? They're people who are maybe sneaking food, hiding wrappers, um, you know, avoiding eating in front of other people. Uh, that degree of psychological, so the, this uh, these scores are somebody who's, you know, uh, really sort of has uh, a relationship to food that, that uh, is closer to an addiction than, say, just wanting or craving a food. Yeah, great point. And so reducing the score by 1.5 is really significant and showing likely improvement. And we actually, when we discussed the mental well-being improvement that is later on they reported, it made a big impact on these people's lives. Craved, we saw similar results. Again, Craved is only at uh, six scores though, and it was still reduced by 1.5, so even more impressive results. So some major points from the authors, an intensive behavioral intervention using a whole food, low carbohydrate approach improved food addiction symptoms and mental well-being. The retention rate in the UK was excellent at 82%, and the United States was only 48%, and in Sweden it was 70%. Typically, if you're looking at a smoking cessation program, you'll see somewhere between 68 to 89%. So for the UK and Sweden, this was pretty close. 
So I've got several things I want to talk to you about, but before I do jump into some of these discussion questions, do you have anything you want to bring up initially? Yeah. So, so, you know, I did see, so bottom line, these, uh, the, there were three groups in three parts of the world, all giving a very similar message. Um, can we, uh, you know, can we help people get out of sort of suffering alone if they're having intense cravings that are similar to an addiction, right? Can we get them, um, can we get them help to understand what it is they're going through and can we get rid of some of the problems right particularly processed carbohydrates so uh, i mean everybody you know anybody who's been doing therapeutic carbohydrate restriction would have known this would have worked right i mean um and maybe at you know later on we could talk about what you've seen in your own clinic at, at wake forest and you know the the poster the sort of the paper we wrote several years back but you know my thoughts are you know this is exactly what's needed it's basically like a aa program for food yeah right that that was my that was my first thought and then yeah absolutely the the second thought i had was wow there's such a wide degree of populations you know it's not just you know somebody in in New York or not, not just, it was three different centers in three different areas. So yeah. a lot of little cultural differences that oftentimes we don't, you know, uh, they're tough to navigate. Yeah, I definitely think that was a big strength uh, of this study. Um, so, you know. Oh, full <laughs> disclosure, I reviewed the, I was one of the reviewers. <laughs> I did, yeah, I did see that. Yeah. Um, so one of the cool things I think to also bring up that I did not discuss earlier was that the mental well-being improved back into normal ranges. So the people in the study had a lower than average for patient population mental well-being. And after this intervention, their mental well-being went back to the general population. And I think that is something that we clinically see a lot, that people, you know, maybe initially were starting their therapeutic carbohydrate reduction for diabetes or maybe someone who's just, they really want to lose weight. But then as they're doing it, they notice, wow, my anxiety is better. My depression is better. I feel like I can be more social. And that's, again, kind of what the paper supported. Yeah. Look, I think uh, when you start doing these sort of multimodal uh, approaches in clinics and focusing on sort of community and the psychology of eating. I mean, it's just, it's liberating. I mean, people feel, they feel heard and better. Definitely. You know? So it's yeah. not unsurprising. Yeah. So I know I have a couple thoughts on this, but in this paper, they looked at whole food only. Do you think that's required to improve food addiction symptoms or where, where do you stand on this? Yeah, so if you look at the data for mental health, like there's data for ADHD and, um, and you know, showing that there's the, the dyes and the colorings and the, you know, even some artificial, there's a mixed data on some of the artificial ingredients having negative impact on sort of mental health. Um, on the flip side, if you look into the literature, there is a study showing that an almond flour, you know, almond and almond flour based uh, low carb uh, interventional study improved you know, depression scores. Um, I think uh, Verda has shown that over two years they were able to decrease depression and I'm not sure that they focused on whole food, uh, you know, like sort of just, just eating, you know, meat and vegetables. I suspect, um, I suspect it's probably better. That would be my gut. But helping people do less harm in the meantime is something to think about. So if you have somebody with severe diabetes and food addiction, you know, and they're craving peanut butter cups and they tell you it's not realistic for them to give up peanut butter cups, well, how are we gonna address their cravings? You know, uh, we have to sort of set them up to, to succeed and we can't just send them into failing and, uh, and not being able to manage their cravings and, 
you know, feeling guilt and shame and powerless and, you know, that all or none thinking that we see in food addiction. So yeah, I don't think it's required. I think it's optimal, not required. Yeah, I'm with you. I think the replacement items are, they really enable a lot of people to succeed. And I think that is something you have to figure out on an individual person to person basis. But I say most people, when I initially start working with them, I am using those replacements and see phenomenal results, even though I know that's not a whole food plan. Uh, But over time, you know, sometimes people, they might use those replacements on a daily basis. And then now they're like, you know, I only need that thing once a week. And so you see that space out commonly. I mean, I was eating, uh, when I first started two or three protein bars a day, cause that's how much I craved sort of chocolate. Now, yeah. I, don't, I mean, maybe two or three protein bars a year, right? This is, you know, eight or eight years later. Yeah. Um, so I, I, I think uh, we have to acknowledge that we live in a world that is normalized, like food that's not food, right? We live in a world like, you know, just because you have food addiction and you're going on a low carb diet doesn't mean birthday parties are going away. Doesn't mean pizza parties are going away. The Super Bowl is not going to stop. Family gatherings aren't going to stop. So the reality is we have to reconcile what's optimal with what's achievable. And that's an individual, you know, that's really individual. And then there's some people who just can't moderate, you know, even the, the, the fake you know, the sort of like the protein bars and, and, you know, uh, it's sort of, they have a, um, you know, disordered use even. So, so like, um, you know, there may be still binge eating behavior. And so it, it's a very tricky and individual situation. My gut is replace what you can't restrict. I mean, that's like easy to say we have, I mean, that's our saying, that's our motto in our clinic, replace what you can't restrict. So meaning you ask people, you know, what can you not, what can you like live? What can you not live without? You know, what's going to cause you to feel deprived? What's going to cause you to feel like intense cravings? And it's just going to be mentally challenging for you in the, you know, when you're just starting and whatever those things are, you know, replace those. And it's kind of like saying, look, you know, you're just learning to drive. I'm not telling you to go forcefully make, you know, flat tires, but why don't you just pack a spare, you know, and a service to to call you for help just in case. Yeah. Right. So I don't know. That's my thoughts. I don't know if. No, I'm with you. I think I'm with you. So, I I mean, I think it gets, then it's like a whole nother world of problems. You know, the, the hidden ingredients in these foods, the, the maltitol, the polydextrose, the prebiotic fibers. I mean, so it comes with its own area of navigation. Yeah, and I think I think that's where the continuous glucose monitors come hugely into play. I actually, I made a tweet recently about a patient of mine who went to the store, bought some keto bread, and her sugar went up over 100 points from the keto bread. Clearly, that is not keto, and it was those ingredients that – count as, you know, you can subtract out. So your net carb is only two grams. And so you do have to be very cautious with some of those replacement items and CGMs can help with that. I 100% agree. CGMs are such a, uh, an amazing tool for food addiction, particularly because, you know, if there's intense shame and guilt, if there's intense uh, psychological distress and, and just, you know, in general, humans don't want to think about eating. Like we don't want to think about going to the bathroom, right? Like we don't want to think about breathing, right? We just do it. We don't think about it. So on top of humans, you know, our human nature, which is to subconsciously eat, right? Somebody with food addiction consciously wants to avoid thinking about their relationship to food because of the psychological stress. So a CGM is so valuable to those people because it just brings action items, places to target, places to talk about, you know, what happened? How can we help you? What, what, what happened in this scenario? It's such an amazing, amazing tool. Yeah. And they didn't even use it in this paper. Yeah. Is. Well, maybe at some point we'll talk about the use of CGMs in food addiction. I think that that would be a, another good topic. Yeah. How about in like 10 minutes? 
<laughs> so, oh, that right. sounds good. So okay. another um, thing I want to point out is that 11% of people with food addiction are normal or underweight. And so I think sometimes there people believe, you know, if you are normal or underweight, you are either healthy or you, you're less likely to be struggling with food in some manner. But this is one out of 10. So I think, you know, that is just something to be aware of. Yeah. I mean, look, you know, imagine, you know, and a, there's a, once you're sort of in the realm of psychologic distress and a relationship to food, our modern world is all about weight and weight stigma. So, and there's pressures on people to sort of maintain, uh, you know, uh, uh, you know, obesity is sort of like smoking in our modern society. It's just frowned upon. So, um, yeah, there is, you know, people walk into my clinic, I mean, with six packs and tell me they need help. I'm like, I, I'm, I was, I was astounded. I remember somebody walked into my clinic, you know, literally one of the first, you know, months we were open and I'm like, what do you, what, like, it says medical weight loss on the front, you know, and, you know, uh, there often there's there, you know, this, this, this person was just in ridiculous shape, but he, he recognized that his relationship to food was off. Uh, so absolutely a hundred percent, these can be, um, you know, people, you know, food addiction doesn't have a phenotype, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, and so this next question, you know, I don't know that I have the answer, but I'm going to be intrigued to what you have to say. What needs to happen for there to be a formal recognition of food addiction in the medical community or as to become a DSM diagnosis? Oh, it's so easy. A drug. <laughs> a drug. Uh, that's if, sad. If a pharmaceutical yeah, company right. runs a, you know, defines food addiction, runs a phase three trial, now it's, now it's a known entity, right? So I'm certain you'll see that within the next five years with GLP medications. And that's sad to say. So what do we need? We need uh, what you and I are a part of and so many others. We need the Society of Metabolic Health Practitioners to um, you know, uh, uh, publish guidelines on food addiction and, uh, and we need the help of everybody listening to make that happen. The SMHP is a not-for-profit. Um, we need members, we need donations so that we can help uh, take the researchers who are already out there doing the research and, you know, get them to craft formal guidelines and publish them, you know, in the medical literature. What do you think? Yeah. You think I, I love what you had to say, actually. I think the thing about the pharmaceutical and a drug actually leading to a diet, formal diagnosis is true and sad at the same time that that is but I think that is where a lot of medicine is actually driven it's based on pharmaceutical research and um, money <laughs> but I think you're right like a grassroots movement and trying to create guidelines around food addiction and just continue this research um, is going to be huge yep 100% um, so you know I don't what do you think about group sessions versus one-on-one? -on -one? Oh, I can't wait to, to hear you talk about this, you know, when we, when we but um, I think you're better, you, you know, what do you think? You know, I think, I think there's something to be said about um, groups, but there's a lot of shame sometimes. And, and there are people, I think, uh, there, are, there are some people who absolutely love it. And there's some people who will not be vulnerable in front of a group. Yeah. So it's a dynamic. Yeah, no, I'm with you. And I'll actually, maybe this is a segue where I'll just talk about our poster we did present at Boca. Because I think you're right. Groups can be incredibly effective. There's data to support people who join groups have better understanding of their diagnosis of diabetes. They have better improvements in their A1C and their blood pressure at group medical visits. Uh, but like you said, there's also, I have several patients who you know, you could not pay them to be a part of a group. Um, and that's okay. There's nothing wrong with that. Um, what we were doing when published in our poster, we were, were using- Can I bring it up, Dr. Laura? Can I bring up your poster? Oh, sure. Yeah, yeah. I'll stop sharing. All right. Can you see it? All right. Here's your poster. So 
So this, uh, well, are we done? Are we, are we done with? Oh, I guess we can do the last thing. And I just, I'll, we don't need to share my screen again, but with yeah. a 20% prevalence in some reports, do you think everyone that comes into your clinic should get screened for food addiction? Uh, so in, in the general population, it's 20. If you, if you add the caveat of people who are, who have oscillated in weight, like, like yo-yo dieted, so to speak, and that are uh, interested in low carb diets and and have are you know so in need of help and support that they walk into my office, I would say it's got to be upwards of ninety percent of people coming into my clinic. So um, and most of the time, well, why is that? People like Eric Westman have done so good at giving a great and easy nutritional program, like Atkins, Eric Westman you know, and half the internet, you know, sort of the people who, who would have benefited from a nutritional only approach, they generally aren't, you know, some of them need us, you know, certainly they do come to us. We do get those people. Um, you know, I'd certainly when employers come to us, we see people who will just sort of focus on nutrition only, but the individuals, I think, um, sometimes I think they, they're looking for more. Yeah. yeah. So I don't know. What do you, I mean, this is I, I think debate. we've be, gone back and forth, you know? No, I, I think it should be something that's screened for, for all. Um, I mean, you can imagine if you're even, you're, you're in your primary care clinic and you find out you do the screening and someone has significant food addiction symptoms and you try to give them the same dietary advice that you give someone who might have zero food addiction, those results are not going to be comparable. You can think about like someone who drinks a few glasses of wine per week versus someone who drinks a bottle every day. If you try to give them the same advice on working on their alcohol consumption, it's not going to be effective. hundred percent. I, I didn't even think about it that way. Right. If you have sort of a, you know, if you're at risk, you know, if you're at risk versus, um, you know, if you're actively using, you know, with alcohol or any other sort of addiction, we wouldn't, uh, we wouldn't give them the same advice. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think uh, the problem is also screening tools, right? That's, mm -hmm. that's another problem. We need a very easy screening tools. We use the cage questionnaire. Yeah. Which I was think, developed for alcohol. I think it just covers it. Yeah. I really like using the cage. I think craved with, you know, the six points it has is pretty, pretty effective. Um, the modified yellow food addiction scale 2.0 is shorter, but still does take a little bit more time and effort. Cool. So tell us about, so you, you know, what's interesting is, is we talked about group visits and we talked about um, sort of CGM use potentially having a, a role here. So you posted a, uh, you presented a, um, a poster at the uh, SMHP in Boca and so just give us, give us a little background into, you know, what was going on here, right? So what, so tell us about the poster. Yeah. So this consists, we can had two different eight subject cohorts, three people ended up dropping out unrelated due to the intervention at all. Um, and within those two subject cohorts, we had bi-weekly, so every other week visits for 14 weeks that were two hours long. And we were using continuous glucose monitors to help with their lifestyle changes and that provide feedback on sleep, exercise, you know, what they were eating. And each week, the first 30 minutes, we would review their own glucose graphs from the previous two weeks. And that would create a discussion. And then we would provide some education after that. And we were not telling people to actually go low carb or keto. That was not part of the intervention. It was purely just using the CGM to improve glycemic control and lifestyle. Yeah, but you say that, but like, I can't imagine a world where there's not like a subtle message of low carb there, right? So a hundred percent. And you can imagine, so I'll give you an example where this is where a lot of low carb discussions took place in the group, right? So a patient, one of the earlier visits came in pretty upset because he had had some oatmeal and some fruit for breakfast. And guess what? His CGM went way above 200. And he said, Hey, my doctor upstairs told me to eat these things and look what's happening to my blood sugar. And so, you know, we understood the frustration there and 
you know, the follow-up question is what can I eat for breakfast if I can't eat that? And then that comes into, well, eggs are great and you can have some bacon or other meat of some kind with your breakfast or maybe some broccoli, you know, whatever it might be. You mean whole wheat bread and vitamin C orange juice isn't the ideal breakfast for patients with diabetes? Incredibly, surprisingly, no. <laughs> So, so you had them. How long was the, the intervention that you had here? How, how many? 14 weeks. So, so you're weeks. really like, you're really getting to know these eight people, right? Yeah. And they're getting to know each other, mm -hmm. right? So you're leveraging the CGM, you're leveraging a sort of a community amongst them and just, you know, a uh, 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 honest review of what happens when we are in our modern food world and what happens to our bodies. Yeah. Yeah, so, I mean, other people would jump in and say, hey, I had eggs for breakfast, and guess what? My CGM was a flat line. So I didn't tell them to go low carb and only eat eggs, but that was, that's, you know, going to happen over time with using a CGM. You mean yeah. when you empower people to uh, know more about their bodies and the dogma that we've been told for years, they will actually change on their own? Yeah, exactly. We, you know, we educated them that heart healthy Cheerios are probably not heart healthy, especially for them. Well, we're not going to get Cheerios, General Mills as a, as a sponsor, I guess. We don't have any, so, but we're not going to get them as a sponsor. <laughs> so what happened to these patients? So, you know, I think in the poster, if I, you know, remember, um, you know, you reported sort of uh, various symptoms, and then you also reported on their food addiction symptoms. So yeah. can you tell us about those? Yeah. So the subjective symptom improvement was pretty fun to see. 92% uh, of people reported improvements in their fatigue, general weakness, and tired. Almost 50% reported improvement in anxiety, depression, irritability, anger, bloating. And then about 40% of people with muscle aches, insomnia, trouble concentrating. And then there are several other symptoms that were, you know, improved in about 30% of people, like mood swings, joint pains. And then um, a couple that were just, you know, 20% or 10% of people. Man, these are like the, uh, the these are like the ten most common side effects on almost any drug commercial I've ever seen. Like, so uh, it's it's sort of interesting. We can market this, maybe we can we can we can market this as a uh, as a intervention, maybe. Yeah. All right. So so what happened to their so so their lives get better, right? Like their their experience, their sort of mental health and, and physical and, and well-being improves. But what happened to their food addiction? Yeah, so this was really cool. So six out of the uh, 13 subjects reported some degree of food addiction. So four, um, one had severe food addiction symptoms, one moderate, and four had mild food addiction symptoms. And at the end of the 14 weeks, none of them had food addiction symptoms. That's amazing. I mean, yeah. that's, that's, I think this is, this is the key here, right? So the key is patient empowerment. The key is, you know, putting them in, in giving them information and tools that are easy to use, giving them a community and a place to sort of discuss things. I mean, what do these, what do they say at the end of 14 weeks? I'm just curious, you know, uh, well, Dr. Them, Laura, the, the CGM gave me an eating disorder. Is that, did anybody say that? <laughs> no. Because that's the critic from like vegan doctors that, uh, that that's, you know, that this CGM can cause, you know, a re, you know, too much of a focus on blood sugar. What do you say to that? I think did these, uh, did these, did no they say data. that? <laughs> Did Absolutely subjects no say data. that? No? Nope. And I've used probably hundreds of CGMs and not a single person has told me that. Um, I have people said they it helped them, you know, much more about what foods they were choosing. It helped them not fall off the wagon as they described it. And it, the biggest thing was, hey, can you please prescribe this for me now that the study's over? And of course, then the money becomes a little bit of a barrier, but uh, that was the most common thing. Well, I hear there's a practice that's trying to eliminate those barriers. So, uh, you know, just, just to announce, guys, we are doing nationwide CGMs for essentially at our cost, right? Um, so if anybody's looking for a CGM, right in our app, the Dr. Tro app, you can just go and order a CGM. 
if you're looking to get that tool. You'll get the pros and cons. You'll get some uh, ideas of things you should know before you get a CGM. Certainly there's informed consent, but um, it's a one-time CGM. If you're interested, uh, you can go get it right through the app. Can I, uh, can I continue on this topic on sort of food addiction and, and, and binge eating or are we, is there any other things we wanted to bring up? I've got just two slides on a recent report that was great um, from Ashley Gearhart, actually out of the University of Michigan. And so we could do that now or after. Yeah, yeah. Well, let, let's do this. So I just wanted to also bring up, um, you know, uh, I worked with a great team, Eric Westman, uh, Dr. Shabani Sethi, uh, Matt Carmen, Laura Saslow. Um, we all came together and this was several years back, about three or four years back. And we did a case series on food addiction and binge eating. And, uh, you know, we highlighted in three cases how, you know, food addiction symptoms significantly improved. Um, and, and the intervention wasn't even focused on it. It was just a nutritional intervention. And what, what made it even more interesting was another crit criticism of intermittent fasting is that it can cause disordered eating. Well, in these cases, in this paper uh, that, you know, that we published in the Journal of uh, uh, Eating Disorders, um, we actually, uh, reduced their, 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 uh, disordered eating, right? So is the nutritional intervention and the time restriction actually reduced their symptoms. Uh, the title is treating binge eating and food addiction symptoms with a low carbohydrate ketogenic diet. And that's from the journal of eating disorders. Uh, awesome. yeah. So let's bring up, so yeah. I think Gearheart posted a survey recently, so you can go. So yeah, I'll up. share again. All right. So, yeah. Whoops. Yep, we got it. You got it. All right. So this was looking at, this was from July 2022, a survey of over 2,000 adults between the ages of 50 and 80 about symptoms of addiction to highly processed food and how these symptoms related to physical, mental health, and feelings of isolation. And... And just kind of a little background, there have been studies that have shown trigger release of dopamine in the brain's reward system from processed food is comparable to nicotine, alcohol, other addictive substances. Um, in the general population, there's about a 10% addiction rate to tobacco and 4% to alcohol uh, prevalence. So in this group, 22% of women ages 50 to 64 met criteria for food addiction. If you look at the whole population between the ages of 50 to 80, men and women combined, 13% met criteria, and 44% reported at least one symptom. So you had to have more than one to qualify for the criteria for addiction. And the most common symptoms reported were in, in about one in four people had intense cravings, one in five were unable to cut down despite a desire to do so, and almost one in five reported symptoms of withdrawal. That's just, uh, I, you know, this is just the general population sort of reading Reader's Digest, right? Yeah. So 44% of the general population has one, one or more symptoms of uh, addiction to, to f food addiction. And, and, you know, just about 15% um, had basically, you know, uh, met criteria, right? Based yeah. on the DSM. I mean, yeah. that is, you know, absolutely amazing. And I, and I suspect it's actually even higher. Yeah, I, on the next slide, we'll actually see when you, depending on which populations you look at, it's significantly higher in uh, certain populations. But as far as just the numbers, so this is on a weekly basis about with the 19%, that's two to three times a week people feel the inability to cut down despite a desire to do so. Signs of withdrawal at least once a week. And then signs of um, significant distress or cause significant problems in their lives two to three times a week and one out of 10 people. And so this goes back to what you were saying. These people are really heavily impacted. Their quality of life is being really impacted by their food addiction symptoms. That's just, uh, you know, I mean, we know it. I mean, this is what our 
you know, clinic is focused on food addiction, diabetes, obesity. Uh, and it's, uh, you know, it's just, it's so nice to, to see that it's becoming more and more recognized. Yeah. So tell us more about the report though, because this looks interesting here. Yeah. Yeah. So the food, food addiction was most associated with isolation in women. It was 51% compared to only 8% of women who did reported rarely being isolated. Wow. So now we're talking about one in two people um, and one in four men who wow. reported isolation. So that's huge. That That's that's amazing. I mean, this is exactly what we're reporting. This is why community is so important for this group. They feel isolated and yeah. it's not a recognized, it's not like you can go to a, you know, hypertension clinic, you know, uh, like you could at a food addiction clinic. Yeah. Uh, so there's something to be said about that. Yeah. And so when we looked at, uh, when they looked at people who reported having poor physical health versus good or great physical health, it was 32% of women versus 15%. And then 14% of men versus 6% of men. Wow. Wow. Yeah. And it gets, when you start looking at mental health, the numbers are even higher where poor mental health, it was 45% of women and 23% of men. So again, we're almost at one out of two and one out of four in those populations. It's just a very vulnerable group. And this is something we've talked about before. It's just a very, very vulnerable, the yo-yo dieters, the people who are suffering alone, poor mental health, huge cravings, don't know where to do or how to start. And it's to the point of physical on one being physically unwell. And, um, and it's just, uh, th this is a vulnerable group. Yeah. Um, and I think that's why, I mean, that's one of the many reasons I love what we're doing is because it's not, it's like you've said so many times, you know, we're not just providing a nutrition. Here's a, you know, here's the dietary advice, hasta luego, but it is a full behavioral approach and really providing that support, getting, building that connection with people so that you can really truly make more of an impact on this thing that is so impacting their lives. Yeah, I mean, I think that's that's key, and you know, there's a reason why in our you know uh, practice we have you know multiple ways to connect. You can come to a big meeting, you can come to a mini meeting, you could come to a small group, you can come, you know, uh, you can meet with a personal trainer. Soon, you're going to be able to meet with a mental health counselor. Um, you can meet with your doctor. You can meet with your health coach. Um, this is the you know, this is the way, this is the way forward. Um, and uh, people want to connect, you know, people want information, they want to connect, and um, they want to, they want to change, they just need the empowerment and the, and the tools. I mean, this is, this is absolutely great. Any sort of summative thoughts or any sort of ways to wrap this up? Yeah, I think there have been, there's more and more data. And when you actually now type in food addiction and PubMed, I mean, there are so many papers and it's actually been years now where there's papers that have been researching this topic. And it, when you talk to anyone on the street, they know it exists. So we as a medical community need to acknowledge it better, get educated in it better so that we can provide better care to our patients because this is something that is really, really impacting people and a significant proportion of the population. And I think these, you know, Dr. Unwin's paper showing the whole food low carb had made a significant improvement in these patients' food addiction symptoms, as well as their mental well-being. what we've seen clinically in our own practice, what we had in my very small cohort of, you know, 13 people, what their symptoms were improving. All of this is pointing towards we can really make an impact in these people's lives. Um, and often that is, you know, currently with a low carb approach. Yeah. I mean, I think uh, because of how sort of addictive sugar is and, you know, we literally can get rats to pick sugar over cocaine. And uh, we know that uh, the, sort of the nucleus accumbens, the part of the, the brain that that's associated with dopamine release is just more avidly, um, activated with carbs, there's a unique role for therapeutic carbohydrate restriction. And uh, I'm, it leaves me excited to see this research. I'm excited because I know we're helping these people and um, we're giving them, uh, giving them hope and a plan, you know, hope and a plan.
Yeah. Guys, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Laura Buchanan. Thank you so much. Uh, oh, it's a pleasure. And just, just so everybody knows, Dr. Laura Buchanan uh, is in our clinic. She's been in our clinic for the past, has it been eight months? Eight months. Um, and uh, she is seeing patients. So if you uh, want to connect with Dr. Laura or myself, just reach out to our clinic. Awesome. And real quickly, there is just a one, two, a couple comments in the question and answer. Um, Susan was wondering, what does one time CGM mean? Does it mean I won't be able to get sensors after the initial one is complete? Yeah, well, uh, that's a tricky question, Susan. Just so you know, uh, CGM certain states like uh, Texas and New York, for example, only allow a one time short supply. So we can't set up like refills. We can't set up subscriptions. We can't do that. Uh, physicians can only dispense. Some other states you can set up. You can dispense as much as you'd like as a physician. But uh, certain states have certain laws saying, you know, you can only do a short-term supply. So that would only be one at a time. Um, so you can only get them one at a time, a short-term supply. If you need something long-term, you can go to your sort of medical team. And then uh, she also asked, is there a database of mental health counselors that are well-versed in food addiction? We're working, on, we're working on that for the SMHP. And pretty soon we'll have them on board in our clinic. So uh, that's coming, Susan. Awesome. Uh, Vic, I appreciate that you're taking time away from your beach vacation to be a part of Journal Club. <laughs> and then, uh, oh, go ahead. Yeah, yeah, we see some familiar faces here, Vic, Brian, Joanne, yeah. everybody, Shelly. Uh, it's nice to, to connect with you guys on Saturday morning. Yeah, and it, the one thing I want to you know comment about, Brian, this is something that I, I think is so um, tragic, but I've seen myself as well, you know, having people who have not stopped eating processed carbs even after amputations, and they proceed from losing one leg to losing the second leg. Uh, and... This is just, I, and Brian was pointing out, I think seeing CGM may have been helpful before the point of no return for those people. Um, but this is something that it, it really is a huge issue. And I've seen again, time and again, where people have lost both, both limbs um, due to their diabetes and continuing to eat highly processed sugary foods. It's just unnecessary. Yeah, yeah. And, and we can help and there's help. Yeah. You know, it's unnecessary and they have help. And that's exactly what our clinic is about. You know, it's about, uh, you don't have to suffer alone and you have people, you have a clinic that's literally, its mission is to reverse diabetes, obesity, hypertension, food addiction. Um, you know, there are teams that can help and that's, that's really what we're here for. Yeah. Anyway. Well, thank you so much, Trev. It's uh, yeah. always a pleasure. Yeah, absolutely. All right. Bye.